going to start over again with the camera working, we hope, and um, shift gears to H687 and look at the timeline that was provided to us on February 26th. Helen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. Um, so, you know, I'm not a graphic designer. Uh, I So they're, they are, you know, they're not lines, they're more like charts, but there are three of them. And so the first one on the first page is the uh, big dates, well, it's all the dates from the big components of the bill. The third timeline has the individual dates that are within the designated area update, and so those aren't directly reflected on here because those are sort of internal dates, but this is the dates by which things are going to happen on the, on the first page. Um, and some of the dates have changed since the bill was introduced, so I, I do think not everything totally lines up anymore. Uh, so starting at the top, the first thing that is going to happen is um, were, <coughs> were this bill to pass with the appropriations intact, um, the appropriations and creation of new positions at the board, the NRB, would happen on July 1, 2024. Uh, next, there is a study in this bill that we did talk about at the end of yesterday about um, a report back on uh, the RPCs. So that's sort of the newest component of this bill. Um, and I know you're working on that, but it is currently just a summer study, summer, fall study committee, so that's only a, you know, six, five month turnaround on that. So that's actually the delivery date, not the start date. Correct, okay. yeah. So it's start July 1. Oh, right, it says start, yeah, it shouldn't actually, well, yeah, and starts a start date up there. Um, yeah, that's when it's due. Mm -hmm. So then next, the next date that comes up is that the new forest block connecting habitat, habitat connector rules are supposed to be filed with LCAR by June 15, 2025. Um, I think it'd be good to just keep going because the ERB board, understanding that relationship, which board is filing those rules, so let's Yeah, and actually you're right, it's not going to be the ERB, it would be the NRB, because it doesn't become the right. ERB until July 1. Right. Important to hold that thought. Yeah. So, the members of the new uh, ERB are supposed to be in, uh, appointed by July 1, 2025, and so this is a full year from passage date, and so just to remind you too, there is the You'll need to stand up the new nominating committee. They'll, the members of that committee will need to be appointed. Is that on this list, the timeline? No. Okay. Because there aren't any dates embedded in it. Okay. So I went with all th things that had dates certain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of things in between all of these dates that will need to happen. So. So would you mind, you, I cut you off, but so we're going to stand up the nominating committee in order to get the board on board. Yep. Stand up the nominating committee, that begins upon passage. Correct. So there is an implement, there is a start date for that process. Sure, okay. And there is a, I think we talk about how it unfolds in the bill, right? So, um, represent on the Would it be outside of our group? Authority, or it's proper for us to say that the nominating committee should be appointed by the by the speaker and the committee of committees by July 31st. I thought we did. Well, you're saying those dates are not not, not a bill, but I should say the same. The, the appointment should be made by July 31st, um, and then that they should, and then give some deadlines internally to say that they should. Uh, once they're stood up, they should develop the rules for the, or the 
procedures, or that they should open a nominating process by, like, say, November 1st or something like that, so that we yeah. give some internal dates. Keep but, it on track. Um, but I can, as we go through the bill, we can think about plugging those in. Yeah, we should do that. Okay. Okay, yeah, because they will need to be appointed and then post the job descriptions, uh, receive applications, interview, review and interview, and then submit names to the governor. So that will take probably at least six months. Oh, yes. There's, do you have a relevant experience in that type of uh, proceeding? I did testify on Haskell. <laughs> I did testify on my experience with the Cannabis Control Board. And so at least six months probably? It, would, it was very smooth and direct. Oh, okay. Yeah. So people were appointed within six months. Okay. So. All right. So that's good to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, so. So once the members are appointed, um, again, and something else that doesn't have a date, I suppose, but should be on here is there is a, well, they're going to have to start doing a few things. Um, I guess, okay, so I guess some of them are listed here, so I'll just go through. Um, so then they'll, they will need to draft guidance for the planned growth area, but I guess tier 1A. Um, application and that's currently set at January 1 2026 so that's within six months of them being appointed the new criteria are set to take effect on July 1 2026 um, and so you have some options here this is six months after the rules have been filed with LCAR um, and so after they've been filed with LCAR, there is an eight month adoption window. It's and actually more like a year, right? So, force blocks making hand jet rules appear to file June 15, 2025. Right, but they won't be, they'll be filed, but they won't be adopted immediately because right. they'll have to go through LCAR. Right. And so you don't have a, you don't know when the effective date on that will be. It will be um, a few months after that. Mm -hmm. So, well, so right, so you have some options here on when you want the rules to take effect. You want them to take effect after the rules have gone into effect. Um, I don't know if you wanted to, initially I think last year, I think it was last year, we had discussed giving a buffer of a f at least a few months after the rules take effect before the uh, criteria goes into effect for new permit applications so that there is notice to people who are developing applications. So you can move this date up. Which way do you mean when you say up? Earlier or later? Oh, you could do either. Yeah. Well, let's keep going. Just get this. So, also on July 1, 2026, the new ERB will need to have drafted the rules of procedure for permit appeals that they are going to hear. Uh, and that is because the jurisdiction over Act 250 permit appeals will tr transfer under this bill to the ERB starting on July 1 of 2026. And do those rules go through LCAR? Yes. Okay. And then also on July 1, 2026, you have the uh, NRB is slated to start review of future of the future regional land use maps that are ready for review. So it's, but that's a start. Yeah. 
Sorry. Just a clarifying question here on the draft rules of procedure for permit appeals. And that is if we make the choice to move appeals to the NRB. Yeah, so this this timeline is based on the current provisions of the bill in draft 4.1. Yeah. So it reflects what is in, yes. Okay. So if we did not move appeals, we did not need to draft rules. Yeah. So then you do have a date in the regional plan section of the bill that, they, that the RPCs are supposed to have adopted their updated plans and maps by December 31st, 2026. Um, so, you know, I don't, uh, um, that's a deadline for them to have taken action. Um, and so the, uh, under this, the way that the bill is currently drafted, the, the ERB is already empowered at that point to start <coughs> hearing and, and doing the review of the plans that are ready before that. Um, That means that, just to be clear, the RTCs adopt the updated regional plans. Doesn't necessarily mean they've all they haven't all gone through the ERB. They've adopted them. They're ready to bring them. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and so then there is the once they're after they have been adopted, they have to be submitted to the ERB, and the ERB has to make a decision on them currently within 45 days after they've been submitted to the ERB. Distracted. So, so, can you say that sentence one more time? so after they have been adopted, they have to submit them to the ERB approval. for approval, and then within 45 days of their submission, they have to be there has to yeah. be a decision. Um, I'm trying to remember if there's a specific amount of time in which they have to send them to the ERB after they've been adopted by their uh, internal process. I'm not sure if there is, so you also may want to think about that if after they have been adopted by the Board of the Regional Planning Commission, if they have to, well, we can talk about that on the next page, I guess, too, the, that process. So the future of land use maps, I'm wondering about the interplay there with, and if those are dependent, I think they are, I hope I understand if they're not, with uh, the ERB drafted guidance for the plant growth area. Mm -hmm. And that would come out, and so you couldn't map that until that came out, right, the guidance? Um, I think that's an open question because the, the way that it's phrased currently in the bill, the guidance is actually for the municipality's application for Tier 1A, uh, which is specific to their bylaws. Okay, um, and then the criteria, uh, does that need to be in effect? But uh, what is it from, like, does that need to be in effect for the future land use maps? So those things are coming in to play at the same time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think they necessarily have to uh, line up. Uh, criteria are different, and they will not be necessarily reflected in the maps in any way. Okay. Uh, so the criteria are the sort of qualitative demonstration that a applicant will need to make. And also, uh, okay, well, uh, I'll just flag that the criteria and um, the tiers and, and the future land use maps, like, I'm not sure how those things interplay at this point. So, not asking for a lengthy explanation, just say, I don't. Know. Okay. Um, 
necessarily understand how they work together. Can I rewind though to the Representative Sui's previous question? Drafts yes. uh, under the ERB drafts guidance for plan growth area application. But so it's they're just they're saying here's how to apply. That that's what the guidance they're drafting is not. Yeah. What it takes to apply, like not the standards. The standards are currently in the bill. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so to make sure that you caught that. I'm not sure that I'm following exactly the difference. Well, one is like, how do I apply for this? And the other is, what do you need to be eligible to apply for it? So, how do I apply is like procedural right. Right, 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 versus right. content. Yeah, and I guess you may want to consider if you have uh, additional information for the RPCs for the mapping. Um, but it's the RPCs and then the municipalities under this draft are supposed to be the ones applying for Tier 1A. So they're sort of separate. They are related, but there are sort of separate applications that will have to happen. Um, yeah, see, and I should have... This is not one of my great skills here, but uh, so on December 15th, which is actually before December 31st, uh, the commissioner, this is one of the new things that's in the bill also is from the last draft, the commissioner of housing shall report on legislative recommendations to better align designation benefits with strategic priorities. So that's just in there also. Uh, but then, yeah, you did. You did. Yeah. Yeah, it's tucked in one of the. It's it's a it's a statutory provision on a future report back. Um, and then so finally. This. This is a little bit fuzzy to me, but I think. It's January one, twenty twenty seven. So the switch to location-based jurisdiction, um, because I believe right now that's the date under which the ERB will begin reviewing application for planned growth areas, or tier one, as you would say. Um, Well, sure, so maybe, yeah, so that is something for you to consider because your you, tier three is kind of in flux. Tier 1B and tier two are directly connected to the regional plan future land use maps. And so there isn't at the moment a specific statement on whether or so that's the only date that's in there right now is January 1 2027 for when tier 1a review and approval can begin and so you yeah I mean you may want to consider a, a date certain by which all of the if all the tiers take effect on the same day or how you want to structure that <coughs> I suspect they'll be somewhat different. So that's the overall timeline. We don't have, unless I'm not seeing it, <coughs> it's implicit, but we don't have a time by which the board <coughs> should have the rules for reviewing the uh, future land use maps. Or did you pull this up there and I didn't? No, I don't okay. think I saw. So we have. Rule. Well, so you've been going back and forth about whether you want to do rules or guidance on that. Right. Okay. And I think we actually had their own guidance would work for that. Right. Okay. Guidance for I'm sorry, which guidance topic? for um, review of the what's required to submit your map. Oh, future land use yeah. guidance. Yeah. Representative Civilian. So. Uh, under review future land use maps and review regional plans, that's the NRB. 
So what is the difference, I'm sorry, between what Representative Bongartz is I think asking it might be the this. same thing we just did for the plan growth area guidance. Like, so how you do it? Yeah, so the commissions know Procedure. what they have to do or how to submit the maps. You've empowered the board to adopt rules or guidance depending yeah. on where you yeah. land, but there isn't a date certain currently by which they have to do right. that, but it's, it's slightly implicit. I, I thought that I heard Representative Bongard saying that there's something missing from the timeline. No, I was just asking. So it's this thing right here. He's asking whether or not there needs to be a separate line item by a date by which they adopt the guidance or rules I for that thank procedure. You. Thank so, you. So they have the, the regions are supposed to Uh, yeah, yeah. Doesn't don't the regions actually adopt and then submit? Yep. So they, they, oh, they, that's just the deadline. They must be done by then. They yeah. can do it sooner. If, okay, got it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yesterday, a section that you moved that may not be reflected in here is directing BAFTA to come up with methodology for the maps. And I cannot remember if you had a date on that, but that would also be relevant to their development of the maps. Right, and so I did make this draft days, days ago, 100 years ago, and so it was based on 4.1, and then you did make a lot of significant changes yesterday, mm -hmm. and I, so it does not reflect the decisions you made yesterday. Um, this is where you were, so there may be a couple of other things missing that I sort of missed, but that's what I did on Monday. Yeah, Monday. When we get more finalized, um, the LCT and uh, ARPC <coughs> specifically that they have kind of done the mental or paper exercise with these dates uh, once we settle on the policy. two timelines are much more specific to individual things you're doing in this bill so the second timeline is a not really a timeline it's the sort of procedural outline on how a regional plan will be adopted and it compares the existing to what's in draft 4.1 of 687 um, so if you're looking at the column on the existing, if there is nothing in the box, that means it's currently not addressed in statute what's happening. So most of what you're, you're building a lot of new procedure around the regional planning commission uh, planning, both before and then after they go through their adoption process. So, so new to the bill is that 60 days before the first hearing on the regional plan update, the RBC will submit a draft regional plan to the ERB and ACCD. ACCD will then coordinate with the other state agencies on the state response uh, and then respond to the uh, proposed plan within 60 days. 30 days before the first hearing, RPC gives a copy of the proposed plan and reporting document, compliance list to the parties entitled to notice under the statute, um, and then they may submit comments and participate in hearings if they wish, and so that's part of the existing statute. They have to hold at least two or more public hearings on the plan, and that's part of the existing statute. 30 days before the last public hearing, the RPC may make changes may make changes to the proposed plan. If they do make changes, they have to um, provide a notice and copy to the list of notice people at least 30 days before the final hearing. So they have to re-notice everyone if they make changes. That's in the existing statute. Uh, the regional plan is then 
uh, ad submitted for adoption, but adopted by a vote of the municipal commissioners of the, the Regional Planning Commission, and that's what's in the uh, statute currently. Currently, what's also what's next in the statute is that the plan is is adopted 35 days after it has been approved by the commissioners, unless there is an objection by 60% of the commissioners or member municipalities. That is being changed in the statute to there's submission after the vote of the municipal commissioners, it is submitted to the ERB for review. Within 15 days of adoption, interested people may file objections to the plan with the ERB. Within 30 days after submission to the ERB, ERB staff provide recommendations on the plan. ERB posts notice of a hearing on the plan within 15 days before the hearing. They then hold a hearing and then they issue a written recommendation on the plan within 45 days after receiving the plan. Um, so I'll start at the last. Um, and so we've got um, these final five places where uh, the public can come in, or interested parties can come in with objections. And what the ERB effectively can do if they find some validity to those objections is what? I think what it is, is they can say, go fix this RPC. Yes. And then that was back to what we were talking about yesterday. Um, what if the RPC didn't, blah, blah, but they will. Yeah. Then, then the municipalities would lose. Okay. And does the bill, I think the bill does specify timelines for, yes it does for go fix this rpc when that has to be done by okay great thank yes. you there's 18 months eight, an 18 month window if they have to make changes okay before the towns lose yeah. um if i have two other questions if i might uh going up to the top um uh, ACCD coordinating with other state agencies on response <coughs> and responding within 60 days. So I think we've seen that state government um, uh, sometimes has some unexpected delays in being able to do their work. And so do we have provisions in the bill? Uh, so could ACCD, can they stop this train? So do they have the ability within this bill to, to say we don't have enough time? Because um, I know we've got public notices in here. Um, uh, no, but they have additional opportunity to submit their comments moving forward. Uh, they can, if they miss the sort of pre-hearing window, there's then the window of time between when they start the hearings and end the hearings to provide comments on the plan. So to flesh that out a little, you asked, could they stop the train? And the train is these 60 days. I think the answer is no. Okay. But then they would still, if they missed it, according to Ellen, they would have a chance to come back if they, for whatever reason, they, other state agencies or ACCD missed the opportunity, they'd still have another chance. Okay, great. And then uh, just looking at the existing, um, you know, the uh, places around notice and the process for the plan, which are all the same mm -hmm. as. Um, uh, when we were 30 days before the final public hearing, RPC may make changes to the proposed plan. If the changes are made, a copy. Um, I'm just wondering how long the RPC can kind of stretch that out. So you're, so they can set up to two public hearings, and then like, how, what is is there a top, finite amount of time which they can stretch that out, or they can stretch it as long as they want? No, I don't think so. Or is necessary? I think what would maybe happen practically is if they had to make changes, they would then schedule another hearing 30, at least 30 days after those uh, changes because they have to have that 30 day notice period that okay. changes have been made. So if there, if um, say there were some new regulations that were causing a lot of consternation within the towns and making kind of adoption difficult, the RPC has plenty of time to keep coming back and setting hearings. <coughs> Actually, there's one, given the uh, testimony we had from a few people, that there's some, was there some thought on the fifth from the bottom to extending 
the period to object from 50 to 30 days. Did we have that discussion? I think we did. Within 50 days of adoption. On the theory, yeah. this is before, just to give a little bit more time, mm -hmm. um, you have to make sure that that then fits within the time frame given to the ERB for acting. So we have to push that out by, by 15 days. Mm -hmm. But just to be, I think we did take some testimony to the effect that people might not even know what's going on within those 15 days. And it's some the notices are sometimes in weeklies. And so. Yeah. So I want to push back a little bit. Okay. To, to file an objection, they have to have participated in at least one of the hearings already. That's, you're right. So hopefully they are at least are uh, know what what's going on because they have to in order to object so they may not know the deadline but i think if they are seeking to object they will be interested in knowing what the deadline is um also so yes you may also want to consider broadly changing the 45 days uh if whether so so yes, you want to make sure that the objection is filed before the ERB is actually going to hold the hearing so that the objector can participate in the hearing and be heard. Um, but then also whether or not decision within 45 days of filing is enough time. Uh, you mean the last line? Is yeah. Written determination within 45 days of receiving the plan. So that takes us, oh, that's, it doesn't seem realistic, right? That's, I don't know. Should I be, mean, I maybe don't. should it be within 45 days of getting the objection? Or within some number of days from receiving the objection? Or from when they had the hearing? That should be, like, it should be a different thing. Yeah. So the hearing within the next days, but with enough time to make sure they can actually do it. And then, So, when, but, and actually, these I know these are shortened, but so um, fourth, one, two, three, fourth from the bottom, within 30 days of, after submission of the objection, were all of this is related to the objection procedures? No. Oh, oh okay. So, we just submitted the plan. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Good. So, the objection is just if, before it. Um, before the meeting, once so they have it before the meeting or the, the hearing, they, they look at whether to adopt the letter or not. They say, I'm sure they know about the objection. Um, right, so I did want to point out, I was saying this a few minutes ago, I don't know if you currently have a deadline by which, after the RBC votes and, and adopts, how many days they have to then to file it with the ERB. We were just, we're just, we're just, we're just commiserating. I think uh, partially it depends upon how complicated the application guidance is that the NRB adopts, mm -hmm. but I would say within 15 days would be reasonable because I trust that they won't make anything too complicated. <laughs> one, one other, um, I had made a note here um, yesterday in doing some of my homework on the RPC study and the public engagement with the RPCs. Uh, I understand there was discussion when I left early um, about the uh, environmental justice um, rules and that they are not obligated to use those in statute at this point. Um, and there was discussion, I was hearing from them their willingness to have that become incorporated in their statute. And so then I just wonder about this timeline, given that. And so I think we just want to here. Hold that thought, yeah, yeah. flag it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of that, so um, I'm not up to date with everything that's happening, other than I, the rules haven't been adopted. Um, okay. that's what I'm 
but a lot of that would happen in the first couple of blocks on the timeline, right? Because public engagement, you want to do it sort of early, yeah. earlier in the process as opposed to like the end. Uh, so, and as we just sort of talked about, it's, it is sort of flexible how they structure holding their public hearings on the plan. So there is time for them to hold more than two meetings uh, and do additional public outreach because there isn't sort of specified. They have to hold, it doesn't say like, they have to hold two meetings within 30 days. This doesn't say that. They have to just hold at least two meetings. So there's flexibility, I think, to fit that in. So it seems like we need to um, track what we need in a certain bill, I think. Uh, uh, just uh, I, I'm trying to grasp the uh, the number of plans that the ERB may be receiving from the RPCs within a certain time frame, and if uh, uh, if they're going to be able to hold all of this, if they've got say ten plans, are they going to be able to review them all, hold public hearings, and give a written determination on the plan within 45 days? So it's just, uh, I, I just want to be comfortable that we're not going to put stress on the NR or ERB and they're not going to be able to, to hold this. Uh, I, I don't know where to get the answer for that. I think one thought I'm having is that um, they're, going to, they're going to kind of roll in. I mean, there's a deadline by when they need to be done, but we've taken testimony, pretty considerable testimony, that a number of RPCs are are already moving in this direction. They're sure. going to be ready. So, and do you have further thoughts, Representative Bonker? Well, a couple. Of, I mean, it's a good point. I'm glad you brought it up because theoretically, you could have the initial crunch, which is what you're suggesting, um, and then over time, once that was done, it wouldn't be an issue. Um, so it raises the question about how complicated the reviews are going to be, and it may be that they're actually, you know, if so many RPCs have been careful and they're submitting plans that are actually going to, they know they're going to get adopted, it should be fairly easy and quick. You could, they could even theoretically hold a couple of hearings in one day um, at the board. Um, I don't, that's not clarifying anything. I'm just thinking out loud here a little bit, but um, the other, the other thing about this is that unlike, for instance, when there's a contested proceeding and property rights are at stake or whatever, where you have where time does matter, here, although it matters, it, it's not urgent ever that these get done, you know, it's been a couple of years and if it takes an extra 60 days, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we don't want to make the timeline so short that we create Difficult in one hand. So I, I'm sensitive but to the fact that the RPCs are doing two public hearings, and, they're, and they're, they're, some of them have started the mapping already, for example. So this will be rolled out over a time period, and then they're going to upload these to the ERB for for the approval. So that, that's where I'm, I'm just trying to under, I understand there's it should be limited the, uh, the amount of uh, objections or or uh, the time frame to review because most of that work should have been done. But I'm just yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I'm I just I'm with you. Okay, we can surely have it right. So I think something you could consider is the deadline by which you want these maps to then be jurisdictional for use in Act 250. Mm -hmm. So you could bump. I mean, right now we're sort of estimating January 1, 2027. Um, you could bump that out. 
so that there was additional time so that mo most or nearly all of the plans had been adopted um, before the use of tier 1B, uh, tier 2, tier 3, all, all the tiers are, are officially used for the Act 250 process. Um, if I heard correctly on that, uh, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Ellen, for that. Um, I don't think it would be the goal to have all of them approved. Maybe I'm misinterpreting my thoughts. Uh, have them all approved before we roll out the tier one tier, because there may be some that are better prepared and more and ready to go, uh, as opposed to having to wait for the, all of them to catch up. If, if I'm if I understood that correctly, but sure, I think there are different dimensions to that. Like I think there's a there's a policy decision there. <coughs> Worf has said that, you know, that from receipt, they have 90 days. To, the board has 90 days. That seems like a lot of time. Um, you know, hold a hearing within 45 days and issue a decision. Although we should a decision ought to be relatively. Mm -hmm. That's quicker. Yeah. So maybe we give them 60 days to hold a hearing. Um, which is a lot of time, and hopefully they'll do it sooner. But and then thirty days to issue the decision. Just try that. Just try that on. Where are you suggesting a change? Um, that when the when the time they receive the application, they have to hold the hearing. When the board receives the receives the application for the maps from the region. They have 60 days to hold the hearing and 30 days after the hearing to issue a decision. Approval or disapproval or. So you're changing this item four up from the bottom. Within 30 days, you're saying within 60? So I was thinking he's sort of changing the last two. Two. Um, although I've always <laughs> found the staff recommendation piece a little odd, but. Uh, <clears throat> I think that it's, so, I guess maybe the function is so that the staff, pe people are guaranteeing that the, someone is looking at the plans within 30 days of them being submitted, but it seems like it might be before the hearing. It, it has struck me as an odd thing to have the statute. In fact, the staff will do that because they should just have the staff do it. Um, I was just wondering about the the way it worked with the PUC, because we're kind of thinking about this ERB acting more like the PUC in terms of its governance and structure, because the staff do have, you know, a role that's, I don't know if it's in statute, but um, I don't know if that came from having that in mind or not. But. Um, yeah, I don't, I actually don't think the PUC has, like, any dead. They have deadlines for the smallest projects on which they have to act, otherwise they're deemed approved, but I don't think most projects they review have timelines established in statute. But yes, this it made me think of the PUC hearing officer process, where the staff, the hearing officer reviews the case and then makes a recommendation to the, to the commission for their review and approval. Um, the commission can then either accept or reject the proposal. Um, But I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I don't know if, if anyone has a thought on that, on that per, part of this procedure. It seems unnecessary to me. Um, but it's, um, I'm actually going to keep on the path of the next ERB holds public hearings on the plan, success proposing within 60 days. And then I, I'm going to also say that this may be changed. 15 days. Well, I, have, I, have, I have 30, but 15 days fine too, because I don't see any reason we should take that long. Mm -hmm. They're a professional board. It's their job. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry, can you say that again? So, the second to the last item on this list, the ERB holds public hearing on a plan within 60 days. Okay. Proceed. Proceed. And then, 
issues a written determination within 15 days. Within 15 days? Okay. At the close of the hearing, in case oh. the hearing were to go to two for some reason. Mm. And are you striking the, the stack recommendation? But do you want to add that the RPC needs to submit to the ERB within 15 or some days after their adoption? It sounded like that would be a reasonable thing to expect. Okay. Yes. document is pulled out all of the dates that are in the designated area update section of the bill as of the last draft and so you did make a lot of changes yesterday but I did and I was starting to but I wanted to sort of pull out that the dates don't actually line up and obviously this part of the bill has been worked on piecemeal over time um, but they don't all match I, I mean, I think they, they largely match, but these are the individual dates within that whole chapter. But some of them we we're deleting entirely. So, like, so we're, we're not, yeah, we're not including it in this section anymore because it's already in the. Um, yeah, but it's mostly not that. Okay. I don't think there have been too many. I don't, I don't know at the top of my head, but I think most of the things that are on here are still in the bill because you actually didn't talk about all of them yesterday. And it is basically about the transitions. Uh, all of centers 5804D. Just D. Yeah, and it's the whole middle chunk there on that page. <coughs> about it because it appears in like three different places in the bill but you did skip over D I believe which is the biggest paragraph on it so yes this this whole chapter is structured kind of in an odd way because it addresses transition in three different sections um, because there is concern about making sure that the benefits expire in a timely sort of way um, so you do need to think about how you want to structure the transition. Big picture, just how are you structuring the transition from the <coughs> current designated areas of five designated areas to the new designations of the two designations? Um, the, key to, the key to this, is, I think, is that, is that we are giving time for the regions to get their maps in Yes. And we put a deadline for that as December 31st, 2026. So this gives plenty of time. <laughs> so will I be missing something if I said it works? Except for that the date not all the dates match. So if you just want me to like line up Okay. So 
I was thinking June 30th is getting a little bit of latitude in case something like you're, you're, you're thinking. <laughs> I mean, just literally December 25th and December 31st, right? Like, it's in the last, it's part of the last 40 pages, so it's probably somewhere around 100. Uh, so it's 5805 is on page 116. 107. 107. There we go. I mean, and maybe it makes sense to wait until we go through today's draft and then update this timeline to see if it works now. I like that idea. Yeah. Yes. That's such a good idea. I think it makes sense to walk through the next draft and then. Okay. Yeah, so with that, let's take a five minute break. We are reconvening our meeting and continue, well, starting our walkthrough of draft 5.1 of H687. What we're going to do is walk through the changes that are highlighted, but I encourage members additionally. So what I'm going to do is follow along in my 4.1 just to make sure that um, things that we want addressed get addressed so we're going to begin walking through with Ellen thank you for getting us this in such a timely fashion okay so draft 5.1 first of all it hasn't been edited because I already found a typo so forgive me uh, but we have a question from representative so if we have other items that have not carried over as changes this would not be the time this is the time thank you for clarifying okay I think this is the time for us to keep the list, at okay. the very least, okay. and if it can be resolved in a timely fashion, we'll resolve it now. Other, other members, a lot of times what happens is, Ellen, first of all, wasn't in the room for all the testimony we took, and she did her level best to get the changes that we walked through with her in person, but we will have things that we caught from other testimony and our other thoughts that now is the time. Okay, so I will be looking for direction on whether or not I'm doing that right, but uh, I would just say on under the purpose section, um, I had flagged that in 4.1, um, the purpose being to hear, appeal for the ERB to hear appeals, which I am opposed to. So just flag that as something I'm still opposed to. I would also like to add something. In this draft, as in the prior drafts, things that are bolded are things that I am unclear if you made a decision on or not. Because in the first few drafts, I was going with just keeping things yellow, and that got confusing about whether or not it was new or in flux. And so things that are bolded are things from prior drafts that I am unclear what you're doing with. Questions on. OK. So, working on that, page two, there are two things. And so, flag, in general, I think you have had a conversation about whether or not any, any language in the purpose section needs to change, and then specifically, if the last sentence of the purpose section needs to change. Sure, so the last sentence of the purpose section, which is section one, is the structure established under this act to be used to guide state financial investment in infrastructure. Yeah. Did, did you have a question about that? I did last time. Yeah. We had a brief discussion about that. And it seems a little vague. Um, okay. It doesn't seem vague to me, and I guess I'll try and explain why. I mean, for me, we're actually identifying, we're using a planning process to identify areas that our communities want to grow, and those broadly are supported by infrastructure investments like most obviously, well, often transportation infrastructure, but also water and sewer infrastructure comes to mind for me when I read that sentence. Representative Logan. 
sidewalks. Thank you. And also the designations program resources are related here too. I don't know if you want to say infrastructure and state. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like community like development. Infrastructure, and you're thinking about the, the, and community the, the development. last third of the bill. Yeah. Um, the <clears throat> but I guess I understand also your question about how how is this going to be used to guide state financial investment in infrastructure? Is that what you're asking? It was before my question, and now I'm at, and I don't want to get too weighed down in here either. But what would happen if this sentence was not in here? Like, what what is the function of this? So if it wasn't here, I think Representative Bob Cox may have lost it. I actually think it's important um, because I think the the maps and the the growth areas and the transition areas, we want to make sure that state investment is made in ways that supports as opposed to undermines what the towns and regions are coming up with with their with the maps and the big one B, and also, of course, the one A's and the one B's. So I, I think I think it's actually an intent of the bill uh, is to help guide investment to follow <coughs> this new level of um, decision making at the local and regional level. And so, uh, <clears throat> so infrastructure. Um, so if you needed, so if you're in a rural community and uh, you're trying to install water, um, could this be helpful? It's meant to be. It's meant to be. And so, well, what's your, were you finished? Because I want to ask your concerns. Yes. My, so my concern is that it could be unhelpful in terms of, mm -hmm. in terms of building or replacing critical infrastructure. Um, and I'm cognizant of it being a state financial investment in infrastructure. So thinking about only that. Um, but <clears throat> and again, I don't want to get and it's too purpose. in the weeds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yep. I know this is Representative Smith. Thank you. Um, would this, when you you mentioned uh, financial investment in infrastructure, would this include housing that would that would be state funded? Um, it could, I suppose, if you consider that infrastructure. I mean, infrastructure more. I haven't thought of that, but but those are state investments sometimes. Um, yeah. Sidewalks. Um, I would just add that I think uh, if you want to keep it, structure is maybe a, an odd word here. Um, the. Structure established. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so it may perhaps program updates established under this act. But um, big picture purpose sections. This is a session law purpose section. It won't have a lot of legal bearing unless there's a Court challenge, which at the moment nothing you're working on specifically has raised any constitutional flags for me. And even if it were, it isn't currently. So this isn't like framed in the legal way. This is more of a statement for those reading the bill, which I do generally advise against. But just because it's sort of saying why you're doing this. I find the change to program updates or suggestion um, to the fund and Ellen's explanation to the next That's great. Okay. So then, section two is the statutory purpose section. And so, again, this was a discussion you had last 
I'm, it maybe should also be bold, but so the purposes of this chapter are to protect and conserve the environment of the state and to support the achievement of the goals of the capability and development plan of 24 VSA 4302C and of the conservation and vision goals for the state established in 2802 while supporting equitable access to infrastructure. From Representative Sebelia. Um, just a question. I, you, you know, I, I know people who hate, excuse me for that word, but um, really dislike purpose language and then other people who really appreciate it. Um, my question is, I have heard people, uh, my, my question is, this language um, addresses the updating of Act 250, the ERB, um, uh, I've heard some confusion as to how much this bill will dot 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 result in more housing. Um, so I'm just <coughs> wondering, um, uh, I find it helpful to have this change would allow the Act 250 program to be a more citizen friendly process. I guess I'm just wondering, does it make sense to add a sentence uh, about um, the fact that this bill will make certain areas, um, well, uh, is meant to make certain areas um, easier or, or not easier, but you know, the, the Act 250 exemptions. I just, I've heard people say, what is this, you know, what's in this bill for communities? And it's critical that we list all this because this is in here, but we're kind of not including the incentives of tier 1a 1b in here as clearly as might be helpful if we're going to keep a purpose section and to that uh, i would note um <clears throat> if we were to say this bill intends to make it easier to develop i, I might want us to say and more difficult to develop in other places and i don't know that that's helpful All of us see that slightly differently, <laughs> Representative Tory. I'm just going to throw in that, you know, we're looking at two different types of infrastructure, the built and the natural. We're mm -hmm. protecting both, which is mm -hmm. the mission of our, of our committee. Um, and I think maybe a stronger statement on that front could be helpful to all of us to get ahead around what we're actually doing here and how important it is. Two. Were you mentioned? Were you referring to the session law purpose section one? Yes. I think this is um, actually it seems like this is a great conversation because we're you know just in this stage of bringing the whole bill together, and um, I encourage members to keep thinking about this and also. Unless someone has something more to add right now. Yeah, Representative Sibelia. Just to, to remind folks my what my concern is here, you had asked before. The, the problem, yellow on, yeah, the yeah, problem that I'm worried about. Um, I think I've brought up a time or two um, around moving critical infrastructure out of the woods, the electric utilities, um, <clears throat> and the challenges associated with that. So. Um, I want to make sure that what we're doing contemplates that we need modern infrastructure in the existing rural communities. And so um, we don't want to inhibit the ability of rural, existing rural communities to have modern infrastructure. 
That's what I'm worried about. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. And I think that I, that's a kind of consistent with what Reptoria is saying, if we can word it correctly. Well, I, I actually, I think that Reptoria is talking about natural infrastructure, making sure that we don't lose track of natural infrastructure as well, and I am talking about no. yeah. poles and wires and but, but water. She said, she said both. She said both. That okay. the, that's, yes. why, that's why I think yes. it's consistent. Yeah. 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 On page five. <laughs> Oh, before you get there. <laughs> How are we going to handle the um, feedback for, uh, regarding environmental justice? I know we're taking testimony from Carla Ramundi tomorrow, but um, but that testimony is on community engagement and. She has testimony that's broader than that. For example, um, on page uh, for the board, um, the composition of the board and the nominating committee. Um, there are recommendations um, that we received regarding. Um, Candidacies, uh, candidates' uh, competency with environmental justice concepts and policies, and uh, page three. I've been over here writing up language based on some recommendations. Um, for example, um, so we might want to ask for testimony on this. I don't know if we want to consider changes right now, and nobody. Um, I'm looking at something that you all haven't seen yet, but uh, on line seven, for example, um, you might recommend um, inserting an or before community planning and then a period and then a sentence like candidates with compet competency in environmental justice concepts and policies shall be offered preference or something like that. And then another recommendation would be for section A um, to add on in line 12, no less than two members shall be individuals who belong to or are well positioned to represent environmental justice focused populations. So those are fairly significant recommendations. Are, <coughs> yeah, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they are very significant. I think we'll hear from you tomorrow on those. Yeah. <coughs> but I like, <coughs> excuse me, I think seating this is fine. And okay. And then on page, for last point on this section, before we get back to page five, is uh, page six. Um, there would be a recommendation under section B uh, to add uh, subsection four that no less than two members of the nominating committee shall be individuals who belong to or are well positioned to represent environmental justice for these populations. So those are the three board composition and nominating committee composition recommendations that we're hearing that I'm not sure that um, the NRB has discussed with fellows on interagency environmental justice committee. We can work we've been working with Carla. Yeah. On those recommendations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. We're gonna hear from you on that tomorrow as well. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to ask a question about uh, on page six. Well, it, yeah. Still oh, yeah. Well, five, yeah. well, actually, Kate brought us to six, so. Oh, oh, okay. This consists of a six member board, and they're going to be voting on things on occasion. Am I correct? They are. 
and I, well, yes, and we did talk about this, so this is based on the Canvas control boards, and they were six, and they actually, as testimony um, revealed, they had unanimous recommendations every time. What do they do in the event of a tie? Ties, no. It is? The motion fails. So, well, and so just, it's, it's the nominating committee. So they're voting on whether or not to send a name to the governor. They still could be a split, couldn't they? <coughs> so if, if it was a tie, then that name would not be submitted to the governor. Right. That's right. That's right. That's no okay, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Page five. Page five. Um, and so we talked about this in the last draft, line 12. <coughs> So if necessary to achieve a, qu a quorum, the chair of the board may appoint a member of a district commission who has not worked on the case to sit on a specific case before the board. Sorry for the typo. Worked on the case. This, this was the, probably never happened, but just the case provision. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Um, so we were just talking about page six and seven earlier during the timeline discussion. Did you want to add language in here for the date by which the members have to be appointed? This is where six? I was suggesting that we want to in order to make, get this thing done in time, we would like to have the members of the nominating committee appointed by yes. July 31st, for instance. Yep. The speaker will make this. Don't know it has to be done in 31 days, but hopefully that's okay. Uh, sometimes getting appointments out of the House and Senate takes time. So hopefully they will be volunteers. Is it, is it reasonable to say that set a date by which applications can be accepted so that would mean they'd have to then do the forms? Like, do we want it so that once they're appointed, they have to move relatively quickly to be in a position to um, make applications available or get Is that a necessary step to say, or is it just something that happens anyway? Um, I'm not sure. Um, one member is required to be from the Department of HR, so hopefully they will be bringing their expertise to that. Um, but if you want to, I don't recall if there was that requirement when the Candidates Control Board Committee was being set up. I don't. I don't recall. So it would seem to me that, that backing up from June 30th of 25, we want to make sure that we got names to the governor by January 31st, let's say, or something like that. So you might be reasonable to say that the application deadline shall be June 30th, but that means they have to, in the meantime, do all things to make it possible to apply. Yeah, you don't know how many applications, you, you know, working an application process, I think you need some flexibility. What if, what if people don't apply? What if you need to do more outreach? They know they need to move. Yeah. Okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Chair. Thank you. Spina Haskell from the NRB. I just think that having a requirement that someone be from the Department of Human Services may not be as helpful as you think because we all, they can give us their advice at a moment's notice and it might be more useful to have somebody from within the administration who actually understands what Act 250, I mean, you know, it's a complicated bill and it has some of those, that kind of background to be able to lend to a review of candidates, et cetera, et cetera. 
the, the so I recall the rationale uh, was that it's was for making sure that there was adequate administrative support. Um, so that was why it's there. That's why it's there. And do we have? I'm not. You mean the person who? I mean, so that they that, that the applications and would go through the DHR. Yeah, and uh, what, all, and all, just all the everything it would take to make the wheels turn while they're getting up and running. And that was the rationale. I'm not okay. arguing. You, you, um, so that. I think they do that as part of the, like, I, you know, I don't know. I don't feel, I don't so, feel at all strong about this. That, well, I just remember that's why we did it. Um, so, I mean, let's just review briefly the, the composition of this. Sure. So, on page <coughs> six, yeah. so the uh, lines 12, the governor shall appoint two members from, from the executive branch with at least one being an employee of the Department of Human Resources. The Speaker shall appoint two members from the House of Representatives, and the Senate Committee on Committee shall appoint two members from the Senate. And this is, this is what they did on the Cannabis Control There were seven members on the Cannabis Control Board Committee. Oh. An additional member appointed by the Governor. So the Governor had three, the Legislature had three. <laughs> Yeah. <coughs> and I think you had removed, because you had heard that all of their recommendations were unanimous, there weren't split votes that you just figured it didn't need an odd number. in their written submissions and <coughs> fairly well documented by a number of us on our draft 4.1. Um, I think it'd be good to have those incorporated in the next draft. And if members have <coughs> particular objections to that or questions about any of that, you could bring them up along the way. But I think, to, uh, anyway. That's my proposal, Representative Sibelia. And I would support that. I think there were some <coughs> questions, and maybe there weren't, so I would definitely welcome being corrected on this. Uh, I think there was adding a requirement of a financial disclosure, a potential conflict of interest, but I think there were some questions around how we would measure integrity and impartiality. Or maybe those are my questions. I don't know. If they were no, I think questions. that Jay brought those okay. up too. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and also work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know that. So I don't know what we do with that for Ellen. So I'll just provide a little bit of information. I will say that this language, I believe, is nearly identical to what's currently in the statute for judicial nominations which is also part of the PUC's nomination. This is what the committee is supposed to review. I think you I think you added one of them. One of the one of the list here. Um, I'm trying to check, but I, I think your original thought was to be very close to what is already happening for PUC commissioners and the judges. Um, and then I guess my only uh, personal opinion comment on that is that when you are interviewing candidates for a job, you don't, I have done that quite a few times, and it's not always quantitative, some of these things, but I think you are 
in turn when you're looking for a job candidate job candidate to fill a job you have criteria which you want that person to meet and so you use your questions to suss out their qualities and did we just make changes to the statute around judicial yeah did we yeah, yeah. Did. Oh, no. well, and, that, and that's based in part on testimony from the office of racial yeah. equity right on the criteria so it would be um, helpful to look and see it, it, it passed the house the other day i think so um what that language is Do you know what that bill number is? No? Do look back at the calendar. Okay. It was this week. It was this week. Um, so I started looking into this issue about financial disclosure just this morning. Um, and so I, ha I need to do a little more research on what is in other statutes. <coughs> Currently, the PUC, I think the only thing that they have for their commissioners is that they have to disclose any um, financial stake or stock in a business related to the work that they do with the PUC, so utilities and energy companies. So I think that's the only financial disclosure they currently have. I know that, but I don't, I don't know. So I, I, um, I may need some additional information on the type of financial information you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be similar in, in that, you know, appointing someone to this board who had um, potential conflicts around, the point is, do they have a conflict in their source of other income because these are part-time people? Um, that would potentially put them at, uh, make them less, make them potentially biased in their review of land use regulations. So I think it would be similar, but it might be more broad than what the PUC has. Does, do members have I think that's right. thoughts? Yeah. All right. The next yellow isn't until page 36. Uh, okay. yep. Just reminding myself here, so is everything else? Um, no, the top of page 10. So these are rules of procedure. And we had in the last draft talked about um, the board's procedure for approving regional plans and formats, which may be adopted as rules or issued as guidance. And so we're giving them that flex flexibility. Yeah. That's a policy distinction, right? So you can require both, but the rules require a pretty strict timeline to follow and take a lot more time than the issuance of guidance. Okay, so you're going to choose one way or the other. Yeah. In the administration, I have a note here, it says the Administrative Procedures Act is statutes clear enough for guidance and it would be more expeditious <coughs> so but we I think decided to leave it work <coughs>
I'm just noting on 13. And again, I, I don't know where, I, I don't know that I've caught the rates since then, but noting again the appeals. I mean, most of the rest of this language is about appeals yeah, so until we get to page 36. filing fees. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, yes, and I could not remember if there's an, an existing provision for waiver of fees based on financial inability to pay. But if there isn't, you can add that. And the court does currently allow someone who can't pay filing fees to waive the fees for, um, it, it, uh, you know, indigent parties. Um. Madam Chair, my only question with this was. <laughs> If somebody is developing a property, putting up a home or a business or something, um, I'm assuming the cost of that would be way more than the filing fee. So I was, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm in favor of or against. I'm, I'm just saying that if they're developing a property for considerably tens of thousands of dollars and, and needing the financial backing of a bank, or et cetera, or some other institution. Um, I, I, I'm not too concerned about a $295 fee. I, I get the sensitivity of it, and, and obviously it was presented to us as a possibility. So I'm not I'm not opposed to uh, moving on this. But I, that was my when I first heard that was that somebody's developed a property. 295 is not much. And I'm wondering if somebody can help me out. What, what other properties or and our ERB uh, decisions or applications <coughs> would um, would there be that I'm missing something that I wouldn't be tens of thousands of dollars? Right. <clears throat> um, so this is the appeal stage, and so it would potentially be a project opponent who's in the. Got it. Thank you. <clears throat> Sometimes yeah. you just need to be reminded. So I think yeah. finding out if it's already in statute or if it's not. Yeah. Yes, I would ask Sabine Haskell to come on, on that. 
that. So we're on page 34, creating positions at the Environmental Review Board. There was a question about additional administrative support to the program. Do you have an opinion on that? Um, I'm um, not sure where you're looking right now, but we're on page 34, yeah. section 15. If they, if you, if you're not doing appeals, you probably probably don't need two extra attorneys. If that's what you meant. No, someone at suggested that with the changes to the program, you may need administrative mm -hmm. help, not necessarily more legal help, but a new position for administrative support. Like, how much administrative support do you have now? In the main office, for example. <laughs> we have uh, we have about two legal technicians that serve the central office. I mean, then we have district technicians that are administrative support um, with the coordinators. Um, the, in the, the short answer is that we would, we would advocate for the two ARPA district coordinators to be made permanent positions. Mm -hmm. Which you have, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and there will be, uh, this is, these would be people that would be added after this bill passes. So uh, there will be time before the appeals yeah. and the RPC review process begins for another, there's an, at least one more legislative session between them for requests for additional staff to happen. Um, page 36, I just changed connecting habitat to habitat connector. On page 37, uh, last draft you considered ecosystem functionality. It's gone back to ecosystem protection. So I don't have a flag on this previously, but on uh, the definition of fragmentation um, uh, would um, utility um, infrastructure be exempted here? I mean, it's not mentioned as exempted, so no. So, um, uh, but so it, it would be a fact determination because I think it's an open question about whether or not, depending on what infrastructure you're thinking of, whether it would actually cause fragmentation inherently. So we right now we have a temporary exemption on moving existing distribution lines from the woods to the roadways. That right now sunsets. That I'm proposing we'll the sunset. I'm just wondering if there would be any interplay with this definition. So this definition is used in the new criteria for review. And so when a project is going through the Act 250 process, the question is: Is it causing fragmentation of a forest block or connecting habitat? Whether or not something is is a fact-specific determination, unless you specifically exempt it. But um, whether or not the I don't know how it relates to what you were just talking about because what you're just talking about actually sounds like it's the opposite of fragmentation. But uh, so okay. Flagging it for myself, I'm happy to go back and think more about this and make sure I understand what's happening. Yeah. To let the first not, 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 saying, not to meet the worst, but I think it, this is about two or more persons. Oh, it doesn't do that. No, this is a criteria that is um, applied when Act 250 has jurisdiction, and with that, we're going to. Break. break for Yay. lunch and come back at 1 o'clock. Um, Madam Chair, I am. Just pick up where we left off. Yes. Just noting, um, I have a meeting that I cannot 
move, and I'm hoping to be back on time. But I may not be, and if I am not be, I will watch the tape. But okay. I'm always exciting. hoping not to miss something What? Important. You're not testimony, right? We're not no, actually, we, we, yeah. we don't have testimony. Oh, you don't have testimony? It's canceled. So we're hoping so to have I you back. back. Yes, we're hoping. Yeah. Somebody should tell me that. Yes. Yeah. All right. Or, or adjourn.